Here are my co-authors. This lecture will be very critical about ergodic economics. My first criticism is the ubiquity fallacy. I explain. Imagine you're studying a set of objects, an ensemble. This can be anything but persons, for instance. An ensemble can be the UK population, for instance. Your interest in properties of those persons can be wealth, can be anything. But everything progresses over time. So let us bring it in. This figure with two axes I call the ergodic figure. Often we have randomness in the ensemble. For instance, UK population, we calculate relative frequencies given probabilities and randomness. Sometimes it happens that the average of ensemble is the same as the average over time. We call it ergodicity, and that is convenient. Then studying deterministic processes gives insight into randomness and vice versa it can be nice. Ergodic theory studies such situations. Growth over time, what we learn from it. For instance, sometimes a transformation of a function can be ergodic, one of the things studied. This ergodic figure, I call it ubiquitous. What I mean, every situation can be captured by it. Always we are studying objects, properties, everything progresses in time. A moderate view on ergodic economics that I agree with says, ergodic theory is useful, it gives valuable new insights, it can answer some questions in economics, I agree. An extreme view of ergodic economics, I disagree. It can be found in many papers by other papers, I abbreviate EEE for it. It says ergodic theory can answer all questions in economics. Here yeah, I disagree. You may be amazed because a moment ago I said the figure was ubiquitous, it captures everything. So then why can't it explain everything? Well, that has to do with the ubiquity fallacy. In general, if something is present everywhere, it doesn't mean it can explain everything. Claiming otherwise is the ubiquity fallacy. And here is a in the underlying superscript. Ignore it for now. I explain later what it means. One way to see that EEE can't be correct is if you realize this is ensemble that axis it captures everything in life except temporal growth. That is way too broad and diverse a category to be captured by one paradigm, one technique. You can think, understand before, and it can't be true. It's too broad. Still, it's a tricky fallacy, and I know a faster cure of it, and that is by showing other similar wrong claims from other fields. Here they come. We can claim that we always have uncertainties, the risk is ubiquitous, then the ubiquity fallacy can claim risk theory can answer all questions of the economics, maybe a life even. We can say molecules are ubiquitous, physics can answer all questions, similar claims for neuroscience, mathematics, game theory, evolution, of time ergodic theory we already saw. All these claims are equally valid, they are invalid, I cross them out. In general, if you can provide some insights, you cannot utter the blue claim that you can provide all the insights. Here is an annotated bibliography on the homepage, it's been there for many years. There's a keyword given many references to people using this ubiquity fallacy. People often use it to oversell the importance of the field. Now I go to expected utility. Imagine a single decision maker, puppet, money amount depending on throw of a die, except to reject that gamble. Expect the utility says, well, first calculate your utility function, calculate then the average of it. If it's good, positive, you accept. If it's bad, you negative, you reject. He, he looks at it and says, wait a minute, you are calculating average there. Well, the ergodic figure captures everything. So either it's average over time or it's average over a sum. Many writers of EE then assume that it is average over time. And then they say, hey, wait a minute, you need ergodicity to justify that. So they criticize EU for wrongly, implicitly assuming ergodicity. I disagree with that criticism because EU does not claim it's average over time, it's average over ensemble. In several writings of EE, they do consider that interpretation, but then they bring a criticism that I disagree with and much with. I explain it. The argument goes, look at those six puppets up there. For average to make sense, all those six puppets must exist in some concrete physical sense. They must be able to meet and share resources. In the UK example that we saw before, this can be conceived, but here it cannot. Of those six puppets, one will come into existence, but the other five will never exist. They can never meet and they cannot share resources. The requirement of the severed sentence is violated. Then EEE says average is not meaningful. 
puts a ban on calculating average. Should not do it. I am puzzled. What else can you do? To continue, let me tell you about applied work I did, experience with that. Eight years I worked in a hospital, the building there, I got a career of work that work. Many cases were at the individual level, single decision maker, and of static chronic health states. We did use expert utility then to recommend optimal treatments for patients, but he, he put a ban on it, not allowed. Not only us, but the whole field of medical decision making does this for individual decision making. All it's the band of EE that hits on them. And the problem is EE says you cannot calculate average, but it doesn't say what calculation that would be allowed. So we don't know what to do. It's confusing. Uh, for clarification, we should go to the economic literature. And we should see how do economists themselves justify expect utility maximization and medical decision making in the same way. I think that question does deserve attention, but EE never pays attention to the question. Let me then tell you how it goes. Economists use preference actionization and empirical performance to justify expect utility maximization. Every economic student in a micro class learn with Neumann Morgs and preference actionization with respect to utility, which is standard knowledge. These things are often used to criticize expect utility. Many economists don't like the model, propose alternative models, propose alternative preference actionization they think are better. There are whole journals and conferences just on that topic. Most of my research work has also been on that topic, but EEE is completely oblivious of all these literature and ideas. They don't know about it. Now I go to EE's criticism of the entire economic field. So EE claims they found a problem in EU. I disagree, but let's give them that one. They say this is a new insight. I disagree again. Many problems have been known discussed before. Let's give them that one. Now comes the third step, even more implausible than what, than what we have seen as yet. On the basis of only that, they claim that they have refuted all of economics. All of economics is invalidated. Yeah, I disagree much. Part of the claim is they say all of economics needs expect utility. Not true. Like physics, economics is a very broad field. Many things are happening there, having nothing to do with expected utility. In general, if you think you refuted one economic theory, you cannot out of the blue claim that you refuted them all. Now I go to further criticisms. Something uh, useful that EEE does is show isomorphism with other fields. That means showing similar mathematical properties. This in itself is not new. Many people have used such isomorphism with temporal choice, but in itself is okay. Although well, you cannot go on to claim that everything else that is wrong and should be forgotten, so that everything else becomes redundant, as EE is suggesting, claiming, you cannot do it. I give some examples. EE growth factor can accommodate a particular kind of cooperation. In economics, game three studies that in general. EE can give maximization of logarithmic function. In economics, risk aversion can do that. EE can give different utility functions due to different growth processes. In economics, different utility functions can be because different people have different needs. Those are isomorphisms, and so far so good. But then you cannot out of the blue claim that only the EEE interpretation are interesting, that everything else should be forgotten and forbidden, that all the other things are wrong. Some writings of EEE suggest that individual differences are not important. We can, we may well assume that all human beings are the same. We should only look at the ergodic growth factor. And sometimes it is suggested that psychology to explain human differences is not very important. That temporal growth factor is more important. All those claims are really absurd, cannot be, it's oversighting, I think. In general, if you provide some insights, you cannot out of the blue claim that you provided all insights. Now, here's another criticism of EEE. In many fields of economics, indeed, growth over time is central and important. But then there are many subfields with many different kinds of such questions. I don't have the time to say much about it. Then in life cycle consumption theory, one point is we do not just maximize the total wealth that we accumulate over all our life. 
We want to have good consumption patterns. We want to have minimal income every month so that we can survive. When we have children, we want to spend more money. Life cycle consumption theory studies such optimization problems, very sophisticated, complicated, and that one growth factor, one function like EE claims that that could capture it all. Absolutely not, that's way too naive. Even in situations where the maximization of the growth factor is important, there are many empirical studies and also theoretical studies and economics into that. But there's a lot going on, but he is completely oblivious of all these ideas and all this literature. Citations now, how I handle them. I told you about these underlying superscripts. There are many here, they are explained. We will not read them all. But I formulated before eight criticisms of EEE and the superscript indicate, identify them. I use them in the next slide. Here I uh, cite many texts from the Peters 2019 paper, but I added superscripts, the underlying superscripts, to indicate where the mistakes that I claim are made are indeed made. So you can verify my claims. I did the same with the Peters and Gelman paper of 2016. Again, underlying superscripts. Well, here is a list of references of papers that I use in my slides. Conclusion, the fact that EEE appeared in a prominent physics journal does not signal any problem in economics. It signals a problem in physics. In my opinion, some physicists were naive and haughty. And with that said conclusion, I end my presentation.